in the last part we have seen an interaction between dislocations so we have seen interaction between two positive edge dislocations also we have seen an interaction between a positive and a negative edge dislocations so we have considered that these dislocations were lying on two parallel slip planes which are edge distance apart we have also seen what is a glide force on dislocation 2 because of stress field of dislocation 1 and we have seen the nature of this glide force with respect to position x of this dislocation 2 on this glide plane so this glide force vary in this fashion now let's find out what are the stable configurations of this dislocations when they interact with each other so from this glide force versus x we can see that there are three points or three locations where this glide force tends to zero so let me write it down so these are three points these are h 0 and minus h that is when x equal to h or x equal to 0 or x equal to minus h the glide force tends to zero now let's consider this position that is x equal to h and try to find out or try to move this dislocation with respect to x now let's consider x equal to h here and let's part up this dislocation that is from h plus minus delta x so let's consider x equal to h this dislocation 2 will experience a glide force which is zero but now when i try to move let's say on a positive side x that is plus delta x the glide force acting on this dislocation will be positive so this dislocation will tend to move along x direction when i part up this dislocation by plus delta x let us write it down so when i have plus delta x the glide force is positive and thus will make this dislocation to move away from this position h now when i am disturb or part of this dislocation by minus delta x that is in this direction what will happen let us write it down so for minus delta x the glide force f glide is negative and thus will make this dislocation to move in this direction so when i part up a dislocation which is at point h that is x equal to h and i part up it by plus minus delta x what i can see that this position is not stable when i part up it by delta x it moves along x direction in the positive x direction when i part up it by minus delta x you can see that this location move towards the negative direction or towards zero so this h this position h is not a stable position that is what we can say now let's consider x equal to minus h when i consider x equal to minus h and i part up it by plus minus delta x what is the glide force variation let us understand that and when i have plus delta x that is on this side so when i have plus delta x the glide force is positive and thus will make this dislocation to move in this direction now when i consider x equal to minus h and i part up it by minus delta x that is towards this side negative side what will happen let us write it down so when i have minus delta x you can say that f glide is negative and thus will make this dislocation to move in this direction and we can say that the minus h position is also not stable configuration for this dislocation now let's consider zero that is origin here and try to understand what is a glide force acting on a dislocation so when i have plus delta x here plus delta x what is happening the glide force will be is negative so this will move this dislocation if i have perturbed it by my plus delta x this will try to bring the dislocation to original position so at this position where the glide force is zero now if i consider delta x to be negative 
that is on this side let us write that down also when i have considered delta x when my dislocation is at point o the glide force is positive and thus will make this dislocation to move in this direction so when i part up the dislocation which is at point o you can see that the glide force will act in a such a way to bring that dislocation at origin or at x equal to 0 so this is the condition which we have looked that at x equal to 0 and if i part up the dislocation by plus minus delta x you can see that the dislocation will try to come or the glide force act in a such a way that the dislocation will try to come at x equal to 0 so this position that is x equal to 0 is a stable configuration for a dislocation so these two configuration that is x equal to plus h or x equal to minus h these are unstable equilibrium while at x equal to 0 is a stable equilibrium so this means that this x equal to 0 that is these dislocations which are positive dislocations this configuration is a stable configuration for these two dislocations which are lying above each other at a distance h now if you look at a stress field around this dislocation and you can see that if i have these two positive h dislocations you can see that there will be a compressive stress at a position where there is a half plane and below slip plane you have a tensile stress field so when we, when we see the interaction between these two positive h dislocations the stress field align in a such a way so that they attain a stable configuration and the stable configuration for two positive h dislocation is shown over here where they lie above each other on two parallel glide planes which are h distance apart now let's look at a condition for a positive h dislocation and a negative h dislocation let's find out a glide force and we have seen the glide force for this kind of two h dislocation which one in which one is positive and another is negative you can see a glide force variation in this fashion and let's mark these three points where the glide force tends to be zero so let's mark these two points which are h 0 and minus h now let's consider the similar scenarios let's say at x equal to h you can say the glide force is 0 but when i part up this dislocation by plus minus delta x let's look at what is the glide force acting on this dislocation let us write it down so when i have plus delta x you can see that the glide force is negative which makes this dislocation if i put up in it in the positive direction which will make this dislocation to move at point h whereas if i consider delta x to be negative the glide force will be positive here here the glide force is positive and thus the dislocation will when I try to move this dislocation by minus delta x, the glide force will be positive and thus it will make dislocation to come to point h. So you dislocation will move here. While in case of let's say minus h, you can see that when I put a, a dislocation by plus minus delta x, let's look at this condition also. Let's look at minus delta x here so when i look at this minus delta x here the glide force is positive and thus the dislocation if i try to move dislocation in this direction the glide force will act in the opposite direction and thus it will make dislocation to come to position of minus h now let's look at O that is this point and try to find out what is a glide force acting on the dislocation when I put up this dislocation by plus minus delta x and let us do that so when, when say for this position at point O 
let's say at point O, when I consider this as positive delta x, the glide force is positive. The glide force is positive, and thus it will make dislocation to move away from the origin. Similarly, when the delta x is negative, the glide force is negative, and thus the dislocation will move in this direction. So when I put up the dislocation by minus delta x, the glide force is negative here, and thus the dislocation will try to move away from the origin. And thus, when we have a configuration where we have one dislocation to be positive and another to be negative edge dislocation, we can see that this position x equal to zero is unstable position, and these two positions x equal to h and x equal to minus h are stable equilibrium positions. So we have a unstable configuration of these dislocations at x equal to zero, and we have stable equilibrium at x equal to h and x equal to minus h. So we have this configuration to be stable when x is equal to h, and thus we can say that these dislocations are on a parallel slip planes which are h distance apart, and also x equal to h, this is a stable configuration. So we can say that the angle between these two dislocations is 45 degrees. And thus this is a stable configuration for a positive and a negative edge dislocation. And if you see the stress fields, you can see that these dislocations will try to maintain the stress field or their interaction is in such a way that the angle between these two will be 45 degrees. So these are the dislocation interactions and their stable configurations. Now let's look at dislocation interactions and how they cause strain hardening. So before that, let's see that what are the stable configuration of dislocations. So when you have two positive edge dislocations, they lie above each other on parallel slip planes, and when we have one positive edge dislocation and one negative edge dislocation and posit on parallel slip planes, you can see that they will have a stable configuration when they have an angle between them as 45 degrees. Similarly, here I have reversed the condition where you have positive dislocation here and I have negative dislocation here. Here I had negative dislocation or negative edge dislocation and I have here positive edge dislocation. So in both cases, we have stable configuration to be maintained when they make an angle of 45 degrees. Mind you, this all edge dislocations are on a parallel slip planes. Now, this we have seen a scenario for positive and negative edge dislocations. What happens when you have two screw dislocations? So we have right hand screw and you have left hand screw. What happens when you have these two screw dislocations? And the answer is, so when you have two dislocations with opposite sign, they will always attract each other. And when you have dislocations of the same sign, will always repel each other. So you find out what are the stable configurations for two screw dislocations. Now let's look at what is the strain hardening because of this dislocation interaction. So we have the glide force variation. Let's say I have considered two positive dislocations and the glide force between them is given by this relation which is gb square upon 2 pi 1 minus mu x into x square minus h square upon x square plus h square whole square. So we have looked at the glide force variation is given by this relation and we can see that the glide force vary with respect to x in this fashion. Now you can see that this glide force variation, you have two minimas and two maximas. Now are these minimas and maximas are equal? The magnitude of this minima and maximum are equal. So to find out what we can do is that we can differentiate this glide force with respect to x, we equate it with zero. And when you solve this, what you can get is that I am giving you steps here, direct steps here. You can find it out 
what the relations you get when you differentiate df glide with respect to x. So you get this equation which is x to the power 4 minus 6x square h square plus h to the power 4 equal to 0. Now if you solve this equation to find out its roots, what will you get is that x square is equal to 3 plus minus 2 root 2 h square. Now if you see, if you solve it further, you can get x equal to plus minus under root of 3 plus minus 2 root 2 into h. Now you can clearly see that this glide force variation with respect to x and when you differentiate with respect to x and equate it to 0, you can say that it must have 4 roots and this is where we are getting 4 roots. So you have 4 roots which are obtained clearly for this position which are 2 minimas and 2 maximas. So now find out what is f glide maximum. So you replace or you put this term here and you can find out what is f glide maximum which comes out to be g b square upon 8 by 1 minus mu into 1 upon h. So you can see that this f glide maximum comes out to be or varies inversely, inversely varies with respect to h. So when h is more, the glide force is less and when h is less, the glide force is maximum or increases. So we have this glide force magnitude coming out to be g b square upon 8 pi 1 minus mu into 1 upon h. So we have, let us write it down, let us mark this. So let's mark this maximas. So this is a magnitude of this maximum and minimum. So this magnitude is given by g b square upon 8 pi 1 minus mu 1 upon h. So this is a maximum glide force which can be experienced by a dislocation 2 because of the stress field of dislocation 1. Now let's look at how this maximum glide force contribute for a strain hardening in a material. So we have figured it out what is F glide max which is equal to gp square upon 8 by 1 minus mu to 1 upon h. Now let's consider these dislocations. Let's mark this coordinate axis x and y and I have a dislocation at origin and let's consider a parallel slip plane and a negative edge dislocation over here and you can see that the stable configuration which we figured it out to be h x equal to h and y is also h. So this will be the stable configuration. So stable configuration means these dislocations are at equilibrium and they are not moving. Now let's find out other dislocations which makes a stable configuration. So we have, I have these two pairs of dislocation. I can make these two pairs of dislocations. I can make these two pairs of dislocation. I can make these two pairs of dislocations. And thus I can make all these dislocations to be in a equilibrium or maintain a stable equilibrium. Now we can find it out a dislocation density in such kind of configuration as dislocation density or density of dislocations can be given as rho equal to length of dislocation upon volume of the crystal. So let's consider the length of dislocation that it is to be L. It is the length of each dislocation and that is we can consider that these are age dislocations. So the length of the dislocation will be will be along a z axis that is nothing but perpendicular to this screen and thus we can find out what is a dislocation density let's consider for that this square this dotted square and you can see that in this region or in this area how many dislocations are contributing so i have one dislocation which is at the center and this four dislocations are contributing one fourth of each. So you have, when I draw such kind of squares, you can see that these four dislocations which are at the corners of this square are contributing one fourth each. So let us write it down. So we have four dislocations and contributing one fourth and one is at the center. So you have 
two dislocations which are effectively in this area of the square. So you have two dislocations and let's their length will be L divided by volume. So what will be the volume of this area corresponding to this area which is going into the crystal. So you have H twice H, 2H along X direction and 2H along Y direction and the length of this crystal will be L. So you have 2H square into L which comes out to be 1 upon 2H square. So you can see that the density of dislocation comes out to be 1 upon 2H square. Now let's apply this shear stress. Let's apply this shear stress to move this stable or stable configurations of this location. So let's uh, I move I apply a stress tau shear stress tau so that these dislocations will move and let's say the Burgess vector of this dislocation is P. So for a dislocation pair to move, if I apply a shear stress tau, you can say that the tau into B that it will be a force which will require to move these dislocations. So that will be given by F glide max. So if you apply a force which is more than this F glide max, then these dislocations will move or glide from away from each other. And you can equate that tau b equal to F glide max. And this tau comes out to be gb upon 8 pi 1 minus mu 1 upon h. I use this F glide max here and I can find out what is tau. Now when I see that I can replace this 1 upon h using a dislocation density and I consider that to be a critical shear stress tau c which can I can equate with k which is a constant gb upon 8 pi 1 minus mu under root of 2 to under root of rho and so what I have done is that I have replaced this 1 upon h using this relation. So you can see that this part let us mark it so this part this term remains constant and I can replace this term by alpha and thus I can find out what is a critical shear stress to move dislocations when they are at stable configurations or when they are interacting with each other and I can see that tau c comes out to be alpha gp to under root of rho where alpha takes the value of 0.5 to 1 and thus we can say that as the density of dislocation increases the critical stress required to move the dislocation increases you can see here the tau c is directly proportional to under root of rho and thus the dislocation density increases tau c that is a critical stress required to move the dislocation will also increase and this is a origin of strain hardening now let's look at how it is related so we have got this relation tau c is equal to alpha gp into under root of rho and when you plot this tau c versus rho you can see that it follows a linear relation a neat linear relation and from this linear relation you can find out what is alpha to be equal to that is 0.5 and it, it lies between 0.5 and 1. Now we know that as we increase shear strain the dislocation density or the mobile dislocation density increases when we consider b and x bar that is average distance a dislocation can move remains constant. So let us write that down again. So when we have a b and x bar constant you can say that when gamma increases rho m also increases and when this rho that is a dislocation density increases you can see that the critical stress shear stress required to move the dislocation will also increase. So from these two relations we can say that 
as I increase the strain on a material or as I continue my plastic deformation, the dislocation density will increase and this increase in dislocation density will further increase the stress required to move the dislocations. And this is depicted here in the schematic where you can see that as I increase a strain, you can see that these are stress strain curves. As I increase strain, you can see that there is increase in stress. Also, when, when you work this material or cold work or deform, so before doing this stress strain measurements, you deform this material with a different cold work conditions. As, I, you, as you increase the percentage of this cold work, you can see that the yield strength of a material is increasing and the ductility is decreasing. So you can see that here from this schematic, what I would like to say is the yield strength is also increasing and the stress required to deform this material is increasing if I am increasing the percentage of cold work. And this is a case study on low carbon steel where you can see that we have the stress strain curves. Prior testing this material, they were cold work, cold work to 0%, 4% and 24%. And you can see that the yield strength of this material increases if I have increase in the cold work. So let us write down. So as cold work percentage increases the yield strength is also increasing also we can see that the strain hardening here or the stress required to deform this material for the same plastic strain is also increasing so let's consider at this plastic strain you can see that the stress required for zero percent cold work 4% cold work and 25% cold work material has increased. So you can say that the flow stress, let me write it down, flow stress also increases with cold work percent increase. So this is an origin of strain hardening because of dislocation interactions. First, let's look at this condition where we see a dislocation interaction and we can say that when I have plastic strain increase that dislocation density increases and thus tau c also increases. So let's consider these two conditions where these dislocations, two dislocations are on the same slip plane now. When earlier cases we have considered that they were on a parallel slip planes or a glide plane, now they are on the same slip plane. Now as you can see they are both positive edge dislocations so there will be a repulsion between them. Uh, the scenario you can consider that let's consider this these locations come together and say that it has both has Burgess vector B so I can consider this as a single dislocation with a Burgess vector 2B and thus the energy for this kind of dislocation will be 4 alpha GB square while for this condition it will be alpha GB square for one dislocation and alpha gb square for another dislocation and it will be 2 alpha gb square. So based on this, based on energy criteria, you can clearly say that this, this configuration, if they are apart from each other, their energy is much smaller or half of that when they are considered to be a one unit or a one dislocation of Burgess vector 2b. So thus, based on energy criteria also you can say that these dislocations will repel each other. Now let's look at one positive edge dislocation and one negative edge dislocation of Burgess vector B on the same slip plane and there will be an attraction between these two edge dislocation and they will attract each other. Now let's see this configuration again. I have a dislocation here so they will attract each other and they will glide on the same plane and they will annihilate each other. So here the dislocation will annihilate each other. Now let's consider a screw dislocations. So they have tangent vector 
along the same direction on the same slip plane. So these two dislocations, skew dislocations are on the slip plane, slip plane with tangent vector along the same direction, but the Burgess vectors are in opposite direction. So these dislocations are of opposite sign and thus they will attract each other and annihilate each other. So this kind of whether it is repulsion or attraction, this kind of interactions will contribute to strain hardening. And this phenomena where you have negative or opposite sign dislocations, there will be an annihilation of dislocations. So whether it is annihilation or repulsion, both interactions will cause a or contribute towards strain hardening of a material. Now let's look at a strength versus dislocation density. Let's plot strength on y-axis and dislocation density on x-axis. We have seen that this is a theoretical shear strength. Let us write it down. So this will be a theoretical shear strength. So this we get when there are no dislocations in a material. And you can see that the variation of strength versus dislocation density will be in this fashion. So as I have increased in the dislocation density, but not too high, you can see that the strength will drop down from the theoretical shear strength and it reaches minimum value for certain dislocation density. And as I go on increasing the dislocation density, the strength will increase. And you can see that the strength will appreciably increase at dislocation density of 10 to the power 10 centimeter square per centimeter square. So this is a dislocation density. For most of the material, the strength will appreciably increase. Now let's look at certain conditions of processing and synthesis where you have a dislocation density for such kind of conditions. So when we have when annealed material, so you keep your material for a certain long duration at certain high temperatures. So that will be at annealing temperatures that will such materials are called as when annealed material. So in such materials, you have dislocation densities to be 10 to the power 7, let's say for aluminum, which are FCC materials. So you will get for FCC materials to be a dislocation density of 10 to the power 7 centimeter per centimeter square. While for tungsten and molybdenum, which are refractory elements or PCC elements, you get a dislocation density of 10 to the power 8 per centimeter square. While for lightly cold work material, you can say that the dislocation density reaches or increases from when annealed materials to 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 11 per centimeter square. And for heavily deformed materials, you can say that the dislocation density reaches 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 14 per centimeter square. And as we see, have seen that as we increase the dislocation density, the shear stress required to move the dislocation increases and let us write that equation again that is tau c is equal to alpha gb into rho. So when I have increase in rho, tau c increases. And this rho increase can be written as, let us write that down also before winding it up. So we have gamma equal to rho dx bar. So when I increase gamma, that is plastic strain, this dislocation density increases. And this increase in dislocation density will increase tau c. And with this, I will stop it.